Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. And right now, we have two events on screen. Better Army Professionalism. Yes, sir. Those two words seem to be the ultimate lesson in the history of military theory. It's not the quality of guns or weaponry that make an army, but discipline. Those men that hold until the death because of a command will be the ones to claim victory. In a world of absolute war of brave new weaponry, it seems that we often forget that simple fact. An army cannot function without those two words, luckily. Anti-corruption programs in the army and new boot camps have brought an army one step closer to the ultimate goal of Spartan Valor. No longer will the men defect or serve political masters. They will serve the generals and nothing less. Excellent. Great, great, great. On the shoulders of giants, Leon Trotsky was greater than an ordinary revolutionary. He was a paramount leader of the Red Army. He was a hero that stood by Lenin during the October Revolution and defended him, or defended the revolution during its early days by reforming the Red Army, from a banded ragtag militia to a regimented and disciplined army. This series of permanent revolution aligned with Tukhachevsky's goal to spread the revolution through the Red Army. But while Trotsky's writings generally aligned with Tukhachevsky's own beliefs, the endless books of theory were lacking in the areas of military and economic organization. The Grand Marshal began to search through every word that Leon Trotsky had ever written, yet he could find nothing. After reading his sixth book with yet more use of theory, Tukhachevsky realized that he could not rely on the advice of the great man of the past. Revolutionaries write theory describing their only their own observations, and Trotsky could not possibly have foreseen the front's present situation. Tukhachevsky had to make decisions in the dark based only on his experiences, on his own experiences, really. Leon Trotsky set down the path before him, but only Tukhachevsky could continue walking. Not even Trotsky can predict the future. I will get more stability, lose some political power, which I don't like. So I asked you guys yesterday whether we should, we should, whether, whether, we should, whether we should do checks and balances or an equal partner. I like both. I don't like losing stability, but I like the 10% more political power game, which is very nice for us. But I do like getting more stability. And slightly more political power. So, at the time of this recording, there's literally an equal amount of support for both sides. So, we're gonna what we're going to do is... I'm going to go equal partner, just because I want that extra political power. I think that's going to be a little bit better. Even though we lose stability, we get stability in this one. I think this one's just a little bit better for us to choose. So, But thank you for letting me know that there's an, literally an equal amount of support for an equal partner. And checks and balances. But, Grand Marshal Tukhachevsky has made no attempt to hide his convictions regarding the old Soviet political class. The scheming of incompetent politicians caused the Union's downfall twice before and led to the deaths, led to the deaths of millions. In spite of this, it seems that politicians may yet be, again be necessary. The new Soviet state faces a myriad of questions, from ethnic autonomy to social and economic policy. There are many hours of vigorous debate ahead. Debates that will require experts, delegators, and compromisers. The Red Army must stand above such petty squabbles, serving only the interests of the international proletariat. Therefore, it is hardly fit for the long-term governance, much less policy-making. The Presidium will be granted significant legislative and judicial powers in matters of national administration. However, this does not mean that the Red Army will become beholden to its whims. The two institutions shall serve as equal partners, both beholden to the Grand Marshal as a visionary and executive. Even though we lose stability, we can always probably get some more, so I'm not super worried about that. Let's see, we have three research slots now, which is awesome. We're still trying to get early helicopters, and actually, these are our improved attack helicopters, which sound quite interesting, but if we really want to use helicopters, we should probably go with this one. So, but we need early helicopter finished, which is technically this one, and then we'll go... Scout helicopters are not bad. I like the recon I think they give you. Right, let's see. Anti sub heli, which it sounds kind of wild. These guys give you no, there's no recon, huh? Okay, for scout helis, we we need transport helicopters to get those helicopter stuff done. There's improved heli transport helicopters. Well, it's one of them. So, and then the attack helis. That's I like that. That doesn't look like a helicopter though. <laughs> um, that doesn't look like quite like quite like a helicopter, but whatever. All right, so next focus. Uh, let's see. Our event. The Presidium meets. The Grand Marshal is seated in front of the members of the Presidium in the hall. A major new economic plan for the following year, drafted by Tukhachevsky, had just been announced in front of the Presidium, and now the members were in deliberation. Finally, the Presidium had reached a decision, and one of the senior members rose to speak. The Presidium of the West Russian Revolutionary Front has come to the agreement to veto the proposed economic plan for critical reasons, including a lack of protection for workers' safety and an insufficient supply of steel currently. For this reason, the Presidium recommends immediate amendments to the plan. He sat back down and the hall was filled with silence, or filled with silence, as all the members watched Tukhachevsky as contemplated before he stood up. He suddenly nodded before signaling his guards. The members watched in shocked silence as the Grand Marshal walked past him. No man rules alone. Now, we still can't do anything on the right side, which is totally fine. But now we have to do loyalty to Marx, or loyalty to the revolution, give more daily political power, stability, 
cost goes up, whatever. Many insisted with merit that the Red Army must remain the sole driving political force of the state. The Red Army secured victory in the Russian Civil War, loyal to the cause of the revolution, and as such, should continue to lead the revolution in uniting Russia once more. Dedicating the army to the faceless cause, the revolution will ensure that the Red Army retains a positive image of beckoning change to Russia while restoring order to the state. Very, very good. And next we're going to do some more uh, agricultural stuff. Great. Now, actually, oh, we already have 61%. Look at that. We lost ability, but we got up to 61%. Not bad. Der Volgestadt. Huh? Oh, der Volgestadt. Where's the Volgestadt? Oh, Volgestadt, down here. There's so many different unique countries out here, but there's another thing, you know, like, no focus trees. Which kind of sucks. NDS. Oh. Maintains a permanent 15 seats in the Volgabund. Huh. Let's see. At the time of this recording, with since we're playing on Cutting Room Floor Patch E for this uh, campaign, I, I always I usually browse Reddit just to see what's going on and see if there's any updates. And there's an update or a potential hint for what the economy will look like once TNO2 comes out or the next update comes out. So it's kind of interesting to see. Loyalty to Marx. The Red Army must stay true to Marx's writings using only their only using their military might to enforce the revolution and free the proletariat. Dukuchevsky and his officers have led the front to its reunited glory, but the state must remain loyal to Marx lest we forget the point of the revolution. Marx recognized that the workers must be able to self-organize and control the affairs of the state and transition to communism. The Red Army will act as an ex executive enforcer of the will of the Soviet people. The beginning of communism against the Russia overrun by Germans and warlords. Protecting the revolution. This is a story of a man named Andre. Andre was not an average middling man who did very, very little in his life. He was not particularly brave or particularly exemplary in any field, but he was smart, at least smart enough to follow the orders and keep his head down. Dmitri, one of the, his comrades, was not particularly smart. A generous, popular man who occasionally spawed with other commissars and tended to win arguments. Dmitri led by example. That is until one morning when Andre awoke to his bunker to find four men in uniform he did not recognize and in the dimness of early dawn moving around. Get up, one spoke as he moved without thinking. Out of the door, he walked with the rest of the squadron into the dim light, where minutes later, mere minutes later, barely dressed, the uniformed men were joined by six more, all wearing smirched badges. Andre heard the stories of secret police, counterintelligence squadrons. However, he did not expect them to be equipped or as funded as the stories claimed. The only other man besides the smirched operatives, fully dressed and crisply white, was a commissar, and he was beaming as one spoke to him. You have done well to inform us of treason within this unit. We will make sure that no problems arise. Your loyalty shall be rewarded. All stated. As Dimitri and his friends were dragged out of the line. What happened next clicked for Andre in a single moment as the operative next to the commissar turned. Men, it has become apparent to us that there is a there is treason within your unit. Thanks to the reports of a few dut dutiful soldiers, these traitors to the socialist revolution will be transferred to where they can cause no harm. In a few hours, you will be questioned. The operative spoke calmly with a smile. Dimitri and the soldiers closest to him were taken, and then came the questions. What is your opinion on the Grand Marshal? Where were you or your relatives located during the West Russian War? Do you know anyone who may have, may have counter-revolutionary ties or sympathies? Each and every minute, they had a new one. And Andre? Andre had no idea if he answered correctly. Ooh, authoritarian, so author ah, authoritarian socialism and more political power. Thank you very much. I will gladly use that for the glory of the Soviet Union or the West Russian Revolutionary Front. Stability would be nice. You get more weekly manpower, but I'm not too concerned about that. We're, I'm probably going to butcher our manpower, to be honest with you guys. Uh, academic base. And maybe we'll do some more research stuff. Because this is it's still going up, but it's not as great as it used to be. 6.5 isn't bad still, though, for equipment. Rudimentary lines. Getting this here will be quite nice, actually. And, and non-nuclear power, only for now. Is anything close to finishing yet? I mean, we have equipment that's a third of the way there. And... Research facility is a third of the way there, so rudimentary research, though. You lose political power, but you get 5% more research speed. It's okay. Primary schooling. You get 5% more research speed, 5% more output, 5% more efficiency caps. So that's why I like to do that one more. So, Anything here? Nope. Alright, next focus. Loyalty to the Motherland. Above all else, the Red Army is loyal to the Russian motherland and her people. Protecting the Russian people from the threats of toxic right-wing ideology and the German yoke is its top priority in these dire times. As warlord rule in Russia is coming to a close, we must remember how great a nation can be when it is unified behind a single cause. Mother Russia is the greatest nation on the planet, and the Red Army is loyal to the Russian nation above all else. And we have a peace conference here too, huh? So, slight amount of debt, but whatever. And I actually have a nice cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm in these trying times in July 11th, 1966. 
Marx and Lenin. The soldiers stood silently as the commissar read a little booklet. Comrades, the soldiers in the Red Army, our one and only duty is to advance the interests of the proletariat across the globe. Even when we declare war, we attack to liberate the working class from capitalist oppression. All of you are revolutionaries, and the great revolution against the capitalist ruling classes. We must never falter in our duty by retreating or suffering defeat. Every defeat for the Red Army is a victory for the bourgeoisie. Defeat is unacceptable. I love that stability, but I really love that political power. Like, it keeps throwing political power at us. I love this. Now, we could do this. And we do more, add more to the debt, and we get a modern increase in GDP, which is not bad. I've never had a campaign where I got so much political power as a warlord state, where I could just keep investing, investing in regional development. I kind of want to invest more, just to see how fast we could get this stuff done. So, let's see. We might as well try it, right? Fifteen percent, and it doesn't cost that much. So, August nineteenth. That's not great, but. You know what? If, as long as we keep building, 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 we'll be okay. We only like 2.2 billion in annual deficit every year, so it's not that bad, right? The reorganization. Russia is no longer a collection of scattered warlords, and we are no longer a band of soldiers, protecting some scraps of land in the Arctic. The time of West Russian revolutionary friend is drawing to a close, and we must draft a constitution for a civilian state. However, the toil and sacrifice of the Red Army soldiers who fought and died for this moment to pass must never be forgotten. As defenders of the revolution against bourgeois reaction, the army must play an important role in all branches, all three branches of the state, not only to ensure the nation is protected from the forces of capital, but to guide its workers towards a great revolutionary war with the fascist invaders. Awesome. Very awesome. 73% stability. Beautiful, my friends. Beautiful. Keep building, keep building. And after that, a loyal presidium. Oh, oh, yes, please. Oh, but this is not bad. What do we get? We lose political power. Rudimentary research base with militarized academia. Wait, hold on. I didn't realize. Research base? Oh, we go cut all the way up here. We actually... Huh. So we basically don't lose any more research speed. But we lose 0.1 political power. That's not bad. I kind of like that, actually. <clears throat> But, since we'll, we'll wait to do that one first, it's only 21 days, land doctrine, we should actually really do our land doctrine, whoopsie. Uh, that's alright. Actually, how many days we have for this one? Nine days, that's not bad. Okay, cool. Sorry, my, my apologies. A loyal presidium. As a West Russian revolutionary front makes the transition from a band of soldiers protecting some refugee workers to a proper social state, we must consider the role of the presidium. The Grand Master cannot be a puppet to its whims if he is to wage war or revolutionary wars against enemies of the working class. The true purpose of the presidium is to function as an advisory body to him, staff with the most loyal generals and specialists in the country who can give him suggestions on how we may better implement socialism in the front while knowing their place in relation to him is truly loyal and glorious. Anything else here? And I just realized, if you look at this, LGBTQ rights decriminalized. Hmm. The Soviet Constitution of 1966. Article 4, Military Service and the Red Army. As an honorable duty of all ci Soviet citizens, the Soviet military is a force for revolutionary change around the world. As such, citizens must aid the Red Army in whichever way they are able. Read the official speaking on top of the platform. A small crowd had gathered to watch first reading of the new Soviet Constitution, which would be enacted as soon after the front was dissolved. How you continue? All Soviet citizens have secured or sacred duty to defend the motherland. Treason to the country, deserting the Red Army, impairing military power, and espionage is punishable with all the severity of the law. Article 5. The Red Army's sole goal is to defend the revolution against reaction and spread socialism on Earth. The Grand Marshal may exercise his authority to overrule the civilian government if it is beneficial to this goal. The Grand Marshal can also take direct control of the country during times of revolutionary war against capitalistic and fascist threats. Article 6. All Soviet citizens have the right to participate in government. Red Army soldiers and veterans possess a higher right to serve as government officials and be elected as they have proven themselves as revolutionaries who are willing to fight to protect socialism. Soldiers who serve as government officials continue the struggle to protect the revolution. Article 7. Very good. Now, we're going to wait to do the land doctrine. It is 66. We're still doing that. We could use some more resources. Engineering, though, doing okay. Let's get some better artillery. Because when we go to war with other people, we need to make sure we make them go kaboom. Peace has been brought. Well, good for you. And upgrades are not too bad. And actually, our soldiers are pretty well trained at this point. It would be really bad if we made these guys 17 combat width. Uh, we need more. We need so much more artillery still. There you go. I want to make these guys 40 combat width, but it's just not worth it yet. 
Hmm. Screw it. We've got plenty enough time before we have to do that. Oh, look at that. They became blue. I like that. So we have a massive deficit of artillery now. That's okay with me. That's totally okay with me. Cool. A lower presidium, a steadfast army. The Red Army is more than just a collection of grizzled veterans fighting a war since the days of their youth. It's the last hope of socialism in a capitalist world that the workers of the army or the world may be free of the fascist menace that has enslaved the entire continents under their heel. However, many, particularly our new recruits, have forgotten this and simply regard themselves as being superior in some way to the civilians they protect. We must remind the soldiers of the commitment to socialist ideology and the working class, whether by an introduction of literature to the ranks, an increase of political officers, or lessons on the tenets of socialism in tandem with physical training. Now, we just lost 100,000 manpower just because that fell in the soldiers there. Oh, Pavlodar is taking out these, the Nova Polska. And actually, when we remove this, rudimentary research, do we still get the same amount of monthly increase of three? That's a good question to ask. A disciplined union, however, is next. <clears throat> Ever since the retreat to Archangelsk, civilian government apparatus have been largely ignored. However, as we make the transition from military resistance to the organized state, we must focus on bringing these parts of the government, such as the civilian bureaucracy and legislature, into focus. It is by these institutions that civilians are trained and led in the quest to unify Russia and defeat the fascist invaders. By introducing military discipline and training regimens, the entire nation can be reforged and transformed into a truly spotted institution ready to support the war against fascism by any means necessary. Oh, we can actually go to war with the Southern Urals. Yes, yes, please. Um, We have 80% stability now. Wow, that is so good. So good. Now that we did the last one, I'm going to continue doing our land auction, which we've barely done at all. 75 days, that is not bad. I love it. And we still get more army XP. You know, we should, we should be training these guys as well. Only missing 10,000 infantry equipment. 2,000 pieces of artillery. Our tanks are looking okay, actually. Well, since we don't have any tanks, I'll just probably duplicate this and call this tanks. Tomsk? Tanks. Which we'll have to edit. Come on, give me more regional development. Please, please, please. A disciplined union, my friends. So, industry for, s for the defense of socialism. Split decisions, workers, war. Ooh, that's not bad. I like that one. Made ready for war. Preparations begin earnest for the Second Great Patriotic War. Ooh. The specter that haunts the world. I like this one. So across the vastness of Russia, clouds are gathering, rifles are dug from cellars, slumbering factories return to life, and men march to drums. The revolution has been reborn in the West, a new union under the tutelage of the Red Army. With it must come new weapons and doctrines. Great efforts will be undertaken to revive the once proud navy as old ships are refitted alongside the dockyards in Arkhangelsk. The Air Force, long the savior of many conscripts, must be standardized. Tanks old and new will return to service, fueled and ready. However, all will be for naught if the worker himself falters. Our men must be made to understand the grand stakes of our mission. <clears throat> for an iron mine will be required to reunite our shattered lands. We will transform militiamen into soldiers and boys into men. This great task must be done in haste. The final struggle approaches. A second great patriotic war for the soul of humanity. The workers and peasants of the Soviet Union will not be caught unprepared again. And I want to do that one just because we get some more army professionalism. So, we've gone from rudimentary research base, or rudimentary academia, to militarized academia. And we still have the same amount of monthly improvement. Which is actually extremely good, since we just jumped to beyond outdated to modern to politicized to... We jumped one, two, three, four ranks in research spaces. Awesome. And now we can get to cutting edge research, which would be awesome, awesome, awesome. As you can tell, I'm kind of excited for that. Extra influence down here, that'd be great. Because we can. And then, discipline hot. Lack of discipline and confidence within the Red Army's office corps and rank and file shall be addressed. Ooh, a discipline mind. This seems that kind of fun. But I want to do industry for the defense of socialism. The true socialist strives for peace in all that he does. Sometimes, however, a socialist nation must marshal its resources to defend itself against the counter revolutionaries. In accordance with the strain of thought, it should be our goal and our duty, our primary objective, to ensure that the industrial complex of our new social state comes in accordance with its Marxist foundations. Nevermore will we showcase abuses towards the systems of industry, for we shall march forward and allow our economy to develop into a tool for the socialist march upon the world. The race for the Urals. To east lay the Great Ural Mountains, the traditional border between Europe and Asia. The Great Mountain Range is critically important to our unification ambitions. In the aftermath of the West Russian War and the collapse of the WRRF, the region was left bereft of any essential authority. Many communes and villages looked to either the city of Orenburg or the soldiers of the Ural League for protection. Our diligence report being uh, that others fell under the sway of the NKVD members in Magnogorsk 
but were sacked by Drobonger's brigade. The rise in tension after the end of the German terror bombing resulted in conflicts that have led to the region's current power structure. The drills present both an opportunity as well as a threat to our nation. Seizing the air's resources and population would be a great boon to our cause. However, on the far side of the Urals, another unified state claims its legitimacy as a true Russian government. Were this opponent to capture the Urals, they would be able to station troops on our side of the mountain range, threatening our eastern provinces. We must thus assert our promise in the region through any way or means necessary. Our diplomats and generals have prepared an array of tools to bring the Urals into our sphere of, in sphere of interest. It is projected that the side with the best combination of prestige, diplomatic success, and military intimidation will be able to first to tip over the local elites into accepting unification. Were the diplomatic option to fail, the military intervention remains an option, an option that our eastern rivals are likely not to accept easily. The race of the Urals is upon us. We will triumph over our Siberian rivals and integrate another part of shattered Russia to our growing nation, a new theater. Now, we could do stuff here. How strong are these guys? Because I normally just like to smash the heck out of Boris Yeltsin's here. Uh, that's not a bad amount of manpower. They actually have, they actually have some tanks. That is not good for us. And our guys are weak. 40 combat with divisions. Hmm. Invest, increase investment. And in oil and bug. True. Much military intervention. So if we can invade them, they invade us. We do have a good amount of planes, though. They're not perfect by any means. Let's see. Fighters, cast, cast. What if we duplicated this? Can we do, can we do that? We don't have a lot, which kind of sucks. Buying time will help us defend and take these guys out. Mm. But on the other hand, if we take Orenburg out and these guys out as fast as possible, they're, they're not that strong. We might be able to get whatever stockpiles they have of guns and artillery. Even though they don't have any artillery right there. These guys, they have a good amount of artillery. So if we rush into them and kill them off, that might, that might not be bad. We do have 17 divisions. As long as we hold the line, that's the most important thing. Uh, they technically do have more divisions than us, though. Uh, but their light infantry is not a problem. Their infantry might be a problem. Mm. Screw it. I just want military intervention. We're going to move in as fast as humanly possible. And actually, I'm going to divide this army to them. We'll take out this group first. Well, they take the Ural states out first. And then defend against the guys up north. So, the, if they take over some of our lands, they might get some resistance, which is good. Altunin? Yeah, he's, level, he's going to defense. I like that one. So, Any upgrades for you, sir? <clears throat> no. Actually, upgrades for anyone else. Vasily, you could actually be the tank general later. If we actually use tanks. Uh, for now, technically, that's not bad. I'm going to go with this and combine arms since he does... Well, actually. Give him back this thing. That'd be fine. There we go. That's not too bad. Obviously, our army is really lacking since I made their guys 40 combat with, but whatever. Industry for the defense of socialism, down the road to freedom. Discipline mind. Fully employed within in the Red Army, discipline rank. Naval warfare, land doctrine, authoritarian socialism. Set an example of incompetence and defeats within the Red Army. Make an example. Not bad. Not great, not bad. Hearts of Steel. I like the attack. Well, that gives me more bonuses. No surrender. Harsh leader, huh? And not an, an army, not a militia. Ooh. Do you know army professionalism? Ooh. Lessons from the south. Begin to improve. Extraordinary training program. Oh, advanced training methods. 12.5% more division attack and defense. Holy bad words. And professional army. Rapidly improved, rapidly improved. Run the gauntlet. Oh, man. I like both of these sides. Let's go with the disciplined hand. Against the warlords of Western Russia, our soldiers seem like Spartan warriors, relentless in their, relentless in their attacks and unbreakable in their defense. Unfortunately, the next enemies we face will be much more dangerous than glorified bandits. The German army is the most well-funded force in the world. In our current state, we cannot hope to match their weaponry, but we can hope to match them in training and organization. The Grand Marshal has ordered that the Red Army be brought up to the standard with the finest armies in the world. There are two competing schools of thoughts on how this could be achieved. Some of our officers advocate for an extreme training program that would produce the most elite fighting men on Earth. They say that since... We will never achieve numerical superiority to the Germans. We must train each of our soldiers to fight like ten. Another faction in the military command is calling for a different approach. The second patriotic war will be massive, and many in our army believe that the only way to win will be a large, highly disciplined army that can meet the fascists head-on in the field. We will see excerpts from an essay. 
And let's see, unification, we can close that for now. Returning expatriates, we're okay. The second international theater form, in its struggle with imperialism, understandably defended the military system. This system became the tradition of the socialists. Gradually, the real purpose of an army was forgotten, and active socialist war was not thought of, and the fundamental task of an army was considered to be what would disturb as little as possible the economic life of the country. The guarantee to the existence of the Soviet state is its main task. Everything else, even economic requirements, must give way to must give way to it. The development of an army lies above all in its combat readiness to develop to the highest degree and in its precise and easy mobility. It is not easy to fulfill these requirements, and that is why they involve a long, hard period of preparation. Only a regular army can receive such training. We thus observe that a red army can only be a regular army. In view of this, every task of a republic must be closely bound with the tasks of the world revolution. This is naturally particularly valid for the questions of the organization of a red army. The first cadre troops of the world army. World red army. Only such an army composed of class-conscious revolutionaries can be the instrument for the propagation of the world revolution and for the destruction of capitalism. Mikhail Tukhachevsky, the Red Army and the Militia. So opines the Grand Marshal. Listen up, everybody. The Grand Marshal speaks, and you shall listen. Even more artillery. Even though I'm not focusing on guns, I'm really trying to emphasize artillery so much. And army interoperability. How's construction going on? Well, ooh, actually, we don't, we don't care about roads for now. I really don't care about roads. 70% is not bad. Do we have anywhere else? The 70% over 100%. Not, not bad. And actually, after that one, let's go ahead and do the 1670 right there. Boom, boom. There you go. Oh, another division. Oh, we actually made divisions. Nice. What what, divi what type of division? It's another infantry, which is great. Great. Great, great. Actually, go and do this, too. There you go. I don't want to deal with that. There you go. So we're only lacking... Actually, Antitech isn't doing too bad. Tanks are doing okay. Artillery is looking about where we expected, as well as infantry equipment. So be it. Launch military intervention. Yeah, this is why I want to take all the goods first. Oh, good. We got more organization for the army, which is really, really good. Support companies. We have some support companies, which is not bad. Recon companies could use more, but... More soft attack for line infantry. Oh, yeah. Please, please, please. And that's going to take some more time. Let's find discipline hand. <clears throat> I love both of these. Now, I wish we could see what this means in terms of my ma mania. Effective change Latino army professionalism. I would love to see drone of the most disciplined force on the earth. Rapidly improve and rapidly improve. Or, will begin to improve. Wait. They both become the most, the most disciplined force on earth. The most elite force on earth. Advanced training methods. So, what are training methods for us right now? Let's see. Social laws, military austerity. Um, let's not cut military austerity for now. Training. Combat schooling. Advanced training methods. So, you really do get 7.5% more. Wow, that's pretty good. Keep spending on the military budget. On the civilian budget, I mean. An army. This is from the south. Run the gauntlet to the letter. I love the rapid improvement. Rapid, rapid, rapid. You know what? I, I, I love both. I really do. At, the, at a juncture. Oh my goodness. Hey, hey uh, starting off? Yes, Comrade Grand Marshal. One of our missing colonels, according to Stavka's re records, presumed dead in the aftermath of Operation Sovarov. And so we now know where this man of ours is. Answer me this, Ustinov. What does one deserter among thousands batter to the front? The Euro Guard. Grand Marshal of the West Russian Revolutionary Front, the Mikhail Tukhachevsky was silent. Dmitry Ustinov let his superior stew for a minute and a half, half a minute before elaborating. You asked for advice on how to whip the front's cowards into shape. A few examples, Comrade Staranov has de demonstrated with their guardsmen and shows merit. Grueling training for to forge elite out of our conscripts. As invincible and legendary as we as when Comrade Voroshilov drew breath. Or we can resort to Aeronomov's own suggestion, though I harbor my own doubts over the fruits his spot and discipline would bear. As always, Comrade uh, General Marshal, the choice is yours. Interesting. Not an army, not a militia. The most disciplined force on earth. I love that one, but I really want advanced training methods. And army professional training goes up by two a month. Hard times. Well, it seems overall, where we're at, this will give, going down this path will even influence how much army professionalism and societal development increase we will get, regardless if we get to the next level and the level after that. So I want to go with an army, not militia, but I love both. We are not ignorant of the challenges ahead. The Wehrmacht is massive and arguably the best equipped army in the world. Or in history. We've rebuilt the Red Army from almost nothing, but we still have a long way to go. The Grand Marshal knows that we cannot stop expanding the size of the army just to improve, focus on improving it. If we're to be victorious, we must can and must do both. We have enough men to field a large army and enough talented officers to field a professional one. The glorified militias that fight for us now must be whipped into shape. They may have been suitable for fighting against bandits and traitors, but against the fascists they will not do. <clears throat> Our reclamation of the Western Russia 
has proven we can achieve anything we set our minds to. The Soviet Union once created a large, modern, disciplined army. We can do so again. So right now, we are currently on political interference, which is not great. But if we get a professional army, we get less division training time, more daily political power, recovery, attack, defense, organization, and spot on discipline is where we're headed, which I really, really, really want. All right. And we have about a month left for that, which is fine. Oh, wow. Anti tank is looking great. Artillery is doing slightly better. Infantry equipment is doing a little better as well. So, great, great, great. And a professional force. Even more war support. We could probably use that, actually. It's a split heart, though. Hmm. Down the road to freedom. The workers' war. Let's grab that one next. While the soldiers of the re front recover from the wars of reclamation and prepare for the conflicts ahead, the workers' struggle is just beginning. As the next war of the German approaches, the men and women serving in the factories will be every bit as important as those on the front lines. Without them, there will be no bullets and shells to fire, no guns and cans to fire them. Our industry is no longer limited to a few factories around our uncles. Our workers need to be ready to work as part of a machine that will spawn or span thousands of miles and consist of hundreds of factories, foundries, and munition plants, all running around the clock to a few of the armies of the front. We will train the workers of our nation how to work in this new war economy. Part of this training will involve the indoctrination or indoctrinating them on their own importance to the war effort. If we can inspire the same fanaticism in our workers as our soldiers, our industrial power will increase rapidly. My mania. <clears throat> I hold considerable doubt that my words might reach you. For the server nation necessitates it passed through countless hands on the way to your residence. However, as its letters compose in the spirit of defiance, I shall gamble against the odds. It has been a long time since we last spoke. Too long, I fear. <clears throat> Your husband, the young idealist who set off from our little Orenburg farmstead, is no more. In his place stands an absence, a hollow shell where a man ought to be. I wish I could report a feeling of glory or some sense that we, we were progressing towards fulfillment of the ultimate cause. Instead, I've, all I have to offer is misery. I'm surrounded by bitter, scornful men who do their very best to make sure that each day is less distinguishable from the last. Each morning, we are rudely woken to the sound of a commissar banging a spoon against a metal pot. From there comes our run, a grueling, miles-long journey from which the only respite is the beauty of the sunrise. A little time to think between drills. <clears throat> I have learned the true meaning of conser conser uh, conservation. Everything can be reused or redirected to a more opportune time, be it scraps of food, padding for boots, or even willpower itself. My body, gaunt and slender, would likely be unrecognizable where you may lay eyes on it again. It is this foreign to me. And the few times I have spied myself in reflection, it seems to move autonomously, responding predictably to the same stimuli and directing itself to areas my authority may never reach. I will not lie and claim that there is any dignity in my routine. Truthfully, it is an alienating and sorrowful process. However, if there is anything good I can report, it is this. I know I will never be the same. With each pointless harassment and each grueling obstacle, of course, I will become stronger. In both mind and body, I can feel my tolerance hardening. Nothing will faze me, as I suppose it should be if I am to face the fascist horse. May peace be with you, darling, and with any luck, I will emerge from the suffering the patron of a liberated motherland. Yours truly, Dimitri. Poverty relief, yes. We must have poverty relief for the proletariat. Yeah, I don't want to cut that. 5.7 is not bad. Mold GDP for the masses. And actually, when can we do this? Oh. Oh, get a war in three days. Well, that's good to keep that in mind. And you guys... Actually, I'll move you a little closer. There we go. We don't have a lot of planes, and that's alright. Southern Urals, we must have absolute superiority immediately. And now, did the enemies come in? Not yet, which is good. Hopefully we can capitulate these guys, take their arms, have a good time with them, have our way with them, and now they are at war with us. God dang it. This one? Yes. You know what? We'll do both. Move quickly. Move quickly. Trucks, move, move, move. Get to Orenburg quickly. Capitulate them. For we must strike south into Beloretsk. Great. City of Orenburg is ours. Great. Now I need you to go here and... Go all the way up that way. Go, go, go. Because these guys are coming in and that's not good. Oh, hello. The worker's wall. Hammering of steel. Forging of metal. Oh, uh, what are we lacking for? Rubber. That's the only thing we're really lacking, so we can wait on that one. We can wait on these two. Ooh, yeah, we can wait on that stuff. The road down to freedom. As the French struggles to rebuild Russia, the question of how to run its economy looms larger every day. Although the Soviet Union followed the new economic policy that espoused limited private ownership of the economy before the Great Patriotic War, the radical socialists in, in, out, in our government not only believe its allowance for private markets ran contrary to the tenets of Marxism, but that didn't develop the country enough that allowed the old Soviet Union to defeat the fascists. They believe that the large state-owned collectives will be able to accelerate the means of production in ways simple market growth cannot and will allow us to rapidly rebuild the country. On the contrary, the more orthodox socialists in the government believe that the means of production are not yet advanced enough to allow the abolition of private markets and that allowing private businesses to operate is a more realistic choice for our level of development. However, a choice must be made soon. And yes, we shall... Make it very, very soon. Come on, guys. 
We gotta hit them harder. Go, 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 go. Help out, help out. You cannot give up. Come on. Yes, we did it, my friends. We did it. Now, the attempt to defend against these guys. They already took over Perm. God dang it. Oh, they have planes and stuff like that, too. That's good. Ah, ceasefire proposed. Arrival set a diplomatic communique. Proposing a ceasefire and an end to the war over the fate of the Southern Urals. The nations that once ruled the region have been conquered and absorbed during the fighting, and as the war continues and casualties continue to rise, neither side has been able to gain the upper hand. The proposed ceasefire would halt hostilities indefinitely and divide the Southern Urals evenly between the East and West. Huh. A ceasefire will be given will give both of our states a chance to recover and lick our wounds. For both states, it will offer a chance to integrate the new territories and prepare for a resumption of hostilities. But calling off the fighting for now may cost either side the initiative later. We must decide if we accept the terms or continue fighting until total victory or total defeat. Well, that's not bad. They definitely have more divisions. Acceptable. A ceasefire between our two nations, huh? That would actually give us more time to prepare ourselves. I kind of don't mind that. Divide the Southern Urals evenly. No. 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 I'm going to say no. Why? Because even though while we're going to struggle here greatly, it's fine. Let the tanks suffer a little bit. They've already lost a thousand. My goal is to drain them of manpower. I mean, obviously our manpower isn't great. And we're trying to do stuff down here, but still. Alright. Alright. Not bad. Not bad. Just gotta wait for our soldiers to get to the front. That's my main goal. So... Um, actually, you guys might be able to take out these guys. Well, can you? Well, yeah. They, hold on, what's in their tanks? That's not that strong. Actually, they're not that strong. That's very good. They might have a lot, more, a few more divisions, but they're not that strong. Let's see. Initiate propaganda. More stability. Marine war support. Mm, yeah, that seems okay. Proposed ceasefire? No, 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 no. Split decisions. Or return to revolution. Increases GDP by a small amount. Restart the new economic plan at the cost of 150 million US dollars. Expertise begins to slowly improve. More military and civilian factories are foreign to the unknown. Increases GDP by a small amount. Industrial equipment begins to improve. Ooh, I like this one a little bit more. It gives you more factories. I like the building slots, but afford to the unknown. Return to the revolution. Uh, well, I'm thinking, you know what? As much as I like this, the collectivization of critical industries. Or return to the revolution. I kind of like the revolution. The humble peasant has been a source of great heartache for the Soviet politicians since the early days of the revolution. It mattered not how many slogans were shouted in the streets of Leningrad or how many unionized workers battled in Moscow. The peasants would stare blank back blankly, incapable of truly understanding the tyrant tyranny of industrial wage labor. It was with him in mind that the General Secretary Bukharin determined that the new economic policy was vital. While there were more important members, or impatient members, of the party wished for the immediate collectivization of industry and agriculture, this was simply not viable in the prevailing circumstances. Marxist theory is clear, and socialism arises out of the ashes of capitalism. It would be foolish to attempt to force it into existence when the foundation simply was not present. It is the opinion of the Grand Marshal that Bukharin, for all of his flaws, was correct in this policy. Now that our situation is stabilized, we can begin to revive the NEP. To stand up to reactionaries of the world over and develop a truly social society, we will first pass through a reform of controlled market economy. Small-scale private industry will be encouraged, as will limited foreign investment whenever possible. Soon we will have our healthy foundation upon which to launch our struggle. Even though I like both of them for this campaign, I think it'd be kind of cool. Now it's time to begin just smashing the hell out of these enemies. Ah, yes. Go ahead and move on in. They're attacking us. We actually beat them up, too. Very nice. Can you guys actually keep these guys here? You're attacking over river, which is not good, but my main goal is just to beat them. Like that. Oh, split decisions. Forgot to read in that. Creaking door hinges erupted in the pen scrawls that filled Grand Marshal Tukhachevsky's office. He glanced up from his paperwork and glared at Comrade Ustinov's approach. A folder nestled against his arm crook. I haven't got all day, Ustinov, he said. Speak up. Ustinov cleared his throat as he read from the document. Work on integrating the liberated zones continued ap apace. Comrade Grand Marshal, reported the general. Food and material from the revolution's opponents are now being repurposed to the Red Army's needs at breakneck speed. My analysis estimate we will replenish our stockpiles within the month and... Old paper flipped, its contents keenly scanned by the speckled eyes of civilians rather than their economic activities, farming, industry, commerce, which the war has disrupted. Stavka awaits your advisement. Kermit Ustinov proffered the folder containing the rest of the report. For your reading pleasure, Comrade General Marshal. Inspection revealed that they also contain recommendations, two in particular. The first suggested reintroducing old Pokharin's legacy to the Soviet proletariat. 
nor the rationale of easing their burdens where the state rebuilds itself. The second contained less theory and more bluntness, collectivization of all war-critical resources at the army's custody. It took a minute for the Grand Marshal to skim through the detailed 100-page document. He returned Ustinov's imper imperturbable uh, gaze with the Red Army's involatile orders. We'll bring back the NEP. Dismissed. Awesome. Propaganda. Nope. Oh, we can move fast enough, please. Come on. Come on. Oh, dang it. We couldn't kill them off. That's fine. Actually, what if we just did a general attack? Can we actually win? Yeah, it seems like we get a lot of green. Okay, this is going a lot better than I thought it would. Like, when they have so many divisions and we can't see what they have, it gets you a little worried. Just a little bit. Land reforms? Agriculture? Yes. And slightly decreased coring times? Absolutely. 100 factories? Not enough. This lost arms plan captured. The continued advance of our troops into the deep Euros has resulted in the capture of the great prize of famed Zaus arms plant. Long known for turning out vast quantities of high quality small arms and ammo. The capture of the plant means we can now secure these weapons for ourselves, while simultaneously denying them to our enemies. Already our engineers and administrators are working to integrate the plant's operations into our wider logistical network, and this should be, complete, should be completed shortly. Although it is in truth only one large factory complex, of which we already possess many, it will not <clears throat> on its own produce a decisive amount of material. We, the value of the plant should not be underestimated. It is a symbol of Russian arms production, and it now belongs to us. <coughs> It is yet one more jewel in our crown. We will leverage the economic, combative, and political advantages it promises to facilitate further advances and conquests until such a time as all the lands and peoples of Russia acknowledge our state as triumphant. Forward. And the automotive plant captured from the Urals. Uh, uh, ceasefire? No, 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 no. With Chilibins now comped, conquered, our men sweep through the city in search of anything of value in the ongoing conflict with their neighbors. Raiding teams zip across streets, firing at the remnants of enemy divisions, holding out homes and buildings scattered across the urban sprawl, and the cackles of gunfire echo throughout the streets of the skirmishes a few blocks away. A few of our men had besieged an encampment holding out in the Euro automotive plant, and upon breaching enemy defenses, the plant was pried from the few dozen men left clinging to their lives. With this now major manufacturing site under our control, our soldiers will now have greater access to off-road vehicles and later confrontations. This is a great potential to improve our, to improving our supply lines and aid in improving the speed of our reinforcements. The powerful engines produced in the Ural automotive plant are renowned for the speed and dexterity over difficult terrain, and will definitely prove useful in their navigational and incursive efforts across the Russian anarchy. Truly, with the aid of the motor, this is a victory for our people and the future of Russia. Onwards, countrymen. It is a great honor. Now we're out of political power. Oh, we have some military factories. Finally, we have enough. More artillery. Oh, t tons and tons of artillery and cast and fighters. Yeah, I'm not even focusing on tanks that much, either. Um, you know what? For tanks, we can do, go a little higher. Return to the revolution. Lessons from Bukharin. Yes, please. During his ten years as General Secretary, Bukharin initiated a series of programs to develop the industry of the Union. One of the most important goals of these plans was to modernize a terribly outdated transportation system. At the time, Russia's rail system was woefully insufficient to facilitate the mass movement of people and supplies required by a modern industrial economy. The fascist invasion interrupted the modernization of our transportation infrastructure, but Bukharin made progress, and now we must pick up where he left off. New rail lines must be laid down, and old ones repaired until we have connected every major town and industrial center to another. We will lay down a new system of paved roads to allow movement across the nation by car and truck as well as by train. Defeating the Germans will require a modernized economy, and a modern economy cannot run on dirt roads and broken rails. Great. I love modernizing the country. Even more artillery. Infinite artillery upgrades. Infinite, infinite, infinite. Alright, so now we're just beating the snot out of them. They've lost 48,000, which is not enough. We lost about 5,000, which actually is not bad, considering what I thought we would lose. Good, and actually, you are there... I'm going to send some cast somewhere else, maybe up north, perhaps? There you go. Split the Air Force a little bit. Actually, at this point, you know what? Just let the armies do whatever they need to do. There you go. And there you go. Eric Speed's not looking bad. 144. Mikhail's, or Michael's, first day at work. It took some time to get the paperwork through. It was so difficult to get the military schools to agree to anything. But Grigorovich had succeeded in getting Mikhail, Michael a day off. It was a special occasion after all, and Michael needed, was needed, as was everyone in the family. They got up early in the morning, and Grigorovich's back ached like the devil as he packed the truck at foot of his apartment. There was so much to handle. Why had his grandfather chosen to go into the carpentry business in the first place? And there was so little time to do in it. Michael groaned and dragged his feet, so bleary and grumpy from the sleepless night. Even with all the commotion, however, they still managed to pull off in under an hour. The wooden stools turned turnstiles, the Venetian blinds, the cabinets, and everything. As they arrived at their new shop, a stone-faced bureaucrat walked up to them, handed them the papers that seemed way lighter than was wise, and stalked off. Gregorovich shrugged and signed. As long as the shop was open, he always said everything was negotiable. <clears throat> the moving process was far swifter than the previous iteration. Most of the fragile wooden items had already been prepackaged, and the only real difficulty was in moving the items that were ill-fitted to the narrow spaces of the new space. Some quarters had to be negotiated by tilting the chosen goods ever so slightly so that they could inch into corners in a manner of a struggling grandmother. So the new shop rose to completion as the sun pierced the horizon. Grigorovich took one last breath. 
or look, <laughs> one last breath, one last look at the paperwork. The new Economic Policy Committee had approved it. Apparently, and beamed at his son, was quietly shaving what appeared to be a, 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 deco a decorative, decorative leg table. He truly was, in a little sense, a chip off the old block, and the reopening of the ancestral shop his children too would have a business to call home. A hot, warming story. Now, I haven't increased military spending for military... Just because I didn't think we needed it, but... And obviously we don't. Artillery barrage? Great. More ground support, why not? You guys are doing great. Do we have any upgrades yet? No, we do not, which is unfortunate, but that is okay. Now, the war is still not won yet, but... I think we're doing pretty darn well. And, oh, wow. Once, or look at that. Tank division is looking so bad. Bukharin's economic legacy is mixed, to say the least. His economic plans did little to prepare the Union for the war against Germany. We were unable to provide the arms and ammunition necessary to fight against the Nazis. This is the most shameful part of the, his economic legacy, but it wasn't exactly a failure. For far too long, this failure on the military and heavy industry front obscured the excesses, or success in other areas. Under Bukharin, agricultural output increased, for example, and more significantly. The Union made tremendous strides in terms of light consumer industry. Not the industry that could kill Nazis, mind you, but the industries that provide by the people of the Republic with wood, clothing, and canned foods. This turned the Soviet Union <clears throat> from an Hungarian backwater to a nation that was industrialized, albeit at a lower level. Everything we do is for the defeat of Germany and the liberation of Russia, but we must recognize that an industrialized nation is not entirely devoted to the production of weapons of war, as an industrialized nation also produces things that people can use in their daily lives, and one day, the revolution will be triumphant, and what will we do with a bunch of artillery plants then? Let's continue with these civilian industrial programs. There's no reason we can't grow both our civilian and defense production at the same time. We'll keep what worked before to make it work again. And one day, we will have a strong and vibrant socialist economy just as Bukharin dreamed. Efforts on all fronts will bring us to Berlin. Yes, they will. Uh, hammering of steel. I want to go ahead and do a professional force. I should have done this a little bit more because we get more army professionalism, but whatever. Modern militaries are characterized by organization. Everyone answers to a superior and is expected to follow strictly defined protocols at all times. While our armies were much more organized than the angry rabble they usually fought against in the reclamation, there's much work to be done before we can meet the standards of the outside world. Every level of the military must adapt to our new standards. Regular inspections will make sure that the rank and file soldiers are are towing the line and maintaining their equipment as well. The officers will be expected to both enforce discipline and set positive examples for our men. Commanders will be responsible for the subordinates and any efficiency, inefficiency, or unprofessionalism from them will result in discipline for the commander as well. By strictly enforcing these new rules, we will restore the Ar Red Army to its original glory. More stability, or I mean war support? Yes, please. Return this one, improve worker training, the bonus for industry, yes, yes, yes. Race for heroes, what a waste of time. They can't do anything against us now. 73,000. Great. They still have bigger or more divisions. We have Svedlosk. West Siberian Republic will follow to us. Now, I want to see what Soblin was be, will be up to. Ready the Commissars? I have played him once. He was a lot of fun. Uh, he's authoritarian socialist. I'm pretty sure I went libertarian. No. He is authoritarian socialist. I went as. I think if I remember. Libertarian socialist, but I can't exactly remember the time it's recording. Hmm. Go. We're doing much better on this stuff. Much, 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 much better. Oh, another division. Beautiful, my friends. Oh, we need to get all the way to Omsk, huh? That's fine, no worries. No worries for me, my friends. A professional force, followed by to the letter. Every position in the military has its purpose. Generals set goals and draft plans. Officers lead troops in convoy with orders. Soldiers capture and secure objectives. When everyone follows orders and does as they are told, the system runs like clockwork. It's only when someone is derelict in their responsibilities that things begin to break down. We remind our military staff that it is of the utmost importance that they follow every order and directive to the letter. Having a clear and disciplined chain of command will dramatically improve the effectiveness of our army in the field. Planning and preparation will be quicker and easier. All soldiers will be able to mount rapid organization or organized responses to unexpected changes in the front line. Whether it is a surprise attack by the enemy or a sudden gap in opening in their lines, our army will be able to quickly react in orderly fashion without the need for dangerous improvements or proposition from our commanders. Very, very good. We get a bonus for land option? Yes, please. Empower workers' organizations? Sure. Why not? And we got to save some political power as well. We almost get two a day. Holy cow. Just so that we can course up quickly. Project Indirect? Huh. Except an extensive weapons program, huh? Naval warfare, I want to go with the forging of metal. In ancient times, only one metal was needed for an army to watch to march to war. Whether it was bronze or iron or steel, as long as the smiths had access to one material, their army could be confident that they were well equipped. Such things are not so simple anymore. Modern weapons need many different materials in order to be created and function properly. Tank engines need special components that must be made of chromium to work properly. Aluminum is vital constructing airplanes as it is the only material light enough to allow them to take flight. It is fortunate that the territory we reclaimed has large reserves of both of these materials. If we want to assemble our, an air force and armored fleet, large enough to win a war against the full might of fascists, we must begin mining these deposits, deposits, uh, deposits, deposits immediately. 
Even the very soil of Russia will give everything it has to the war effort. A day in the life. Down yelled at his commander, and without thinking, Dmitri rose dove forward. His face smashed into the mud, and for a moment the world was dark, cold, and earthy. Then there was moving forwards, crawling on his belly, his uniforms in need of a stern washing. He saw Vladimir to his left. Red face red with exertion and smiled. The Moscow refugees pudged at him melted off during the long trek from his home, and he supposed he shouldn't be surprised that it wouldn't un wouldn't under their hard training. Nevertheless, what his companion lacked in physique more than made up for his muscle. When the time came for rubble or rubble drills, they had to practice hurriedly clearing a bomb bunker. Vlad's strength would come in handy for the unit. Up, run, yelled the commander, and the soldiers began to sprint to the next stage of the obstacle course. Dmitri scrambled to his feet and rushed towards forwards. He remembered how he had grimaced and moaned during the day, early days of his service, and he felt a renewed burst of speed. He found himself at the next stage among the guns and began to assemble his rifle. For once his fingers didn't fail him, when he looked up, he saw to his great surprise he finished first. Later, Dmitri and his unit would celebrate in true Russian style. There would be music, food, and a flood of vodka. More likely than not, he would awake with a nameless girl in his bed and a throbbing headache, but neither would last long enough through the hard soldier's life and cold northern sun. He was a king for a day, but a fighter for life, and true war never uh, had not even begun. A good life, he supposed. End of the division. Very good. Vokuta Gulags captured. As the men swept towards Arctic plans, infamously dreadful for Kuta Gulags came under our administration. The dark complexes of watchtowers, gloomy barracks, and liver camps strike a trembling fear in these icy waters or wastes. The unbelievable torture of this natural prison served as a reminder for the wickedness of men. The enemy's men lay scattered around the courtyard, buried in debris, and torn to pieces by the machine gun fire. With blood freshly painted on dark brick walls, the smell of gunpowder was thick and silence after battles de deafening. We were in a place of immense suffering, and whilst many of our men broke down doors to scurry and rummage for loot, others lowered their weapons to gaze at the daunting set dwarf them. With the gulags largely preserved from war, however, this does pose a th question. Are we to close the site down forever and let it remain a relic of a barbarous past, or may we plunge our hands in the dirty realities of this war so that Russia may live on? Something, sometimes great men do awful things. Great! We are looking tremendous, my friends. We have done a great, great thing for our soldiers, for the motherland and for the proletariat. I sound integrate some areas, like Sved Svedlosk. That'd be awesome. Now we can't do other stuff, but that's okay. That is totally okay. Forging of metal, eh? Well, let's go and do this one first. Russian re Oh! Russian reunification? Ooh, does that hurt our focus tree? This shouldn't hurt our focus tree, right? Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we get stability, which is nice and all. But, we're gonna wait to do that. We're gonna go ahead and do Zlatalus first, and do the... Well, hmm... We'll see, we'll see off-screen once this episode is over. Let's go ahead and do, after that, the hammering of steel. A modern war requires massive amounts of resources, both figuratively and literally. While the cost of money and men in time is great, so is the cost of steel without steel. Every weapon from a grenade to a tank cannot be produced. Without tungsten, we cannot make armor-piercing ammo that will be essential to defeating the mass tank formations that the Germans are so fond of. During the reign of the warlords, <clears throat> when the traders forced us back to the far north, shortages of both these materials hampered out our war production. Now, we've reclaimed much of our nation, including several promising but unexploited resource deposits. Tukhachevsky has ordered that the production of all material useful to the coming war be increased immediately. Mine these deposits will increase our available steel and tungsten reserves and make us less reliant on outside imports to build up our weapons. Very good. Let's go and integrate some more places. Ugra, thank you. And we're not done with our soldiers yet. They must train if they wish to remain competent. Yay, early helicopters. Great, great, great. Scout helicopters. Let's go and come down here now. That's all air ones. Yes, please. And begin making some. Is it under here? Early experimental? No. This one. This is the one we really want. We gotta go five guns. We'll go to two for now. And then we'll go to two as well. That's okay with me. Artillery is looking a lot, lot better. Holy cow. Bank tanks are not looking too bad either. And how much? Oh, wow. We have 63 billion. Nice. Uh, that's okay. Slash it. Five billion a year is pretty bad, though. Five days, four days. That's okay. The Helm of Tanks, the greatest lesson from the Second World War, taught the, list, taught the world that is is that modern warfare is motorized. The German tank divisions were unstoppable as they rolled across Eastern, across Europe. Since the war, the importance of fighting vehicles has only increased in addition to tanks. Modern armies fueled armored troops transport to carry infantry as well as heavily armed vehicles designed to transport soldiers into combat and provide direct fire support during battle. To catch up with the rest of the world, we will prioritize assembling the vehicles for a full year. <clears throat> At the price of a greater production cost, the factories will churn out more vehicles than ever before. Every single tank, armor transport, and fighting vehicle that rolls off assembly lines will shrink the gap between our forces and the Germans. When the Second Patriotic War comes, the fascists will not find themselves repelling a horde of infantry, but crushed under a wheels of armored wave. So we produce a lot more things much more quickly. That is fine with me. We still would like some tanks. And we can still use more army XP, but I think we're doing okay. Uh, it's 67. It is 1967. Hope you're having a great year. Continue integrating more places. It only takes 20 days. That is so good. So, so good. 
Helmet tanks, I love it. Actually, we've got 12 days, 11, 10 days, that's not bad. So, after this one, we're probably going to go ahead and do support companies, because I love support companies so much. Some of my favorite things. Organization indicates combat readiness and how organized a unit is. A unit with no organization can't fight or move effectively. Pretty much. And more soft attack. How many attacks a unit can make versus enemies with low hardness. Um, okay. Cool. Oh, let's integrate some more places. Great. And actually, this is so nice. It's so quick. And you don't lose that much stability or political power by doing this with such a short amount of time. The simplest soldier. If the front is a machine, then the workers are the fuel it runs on. Without their humble efforts, the factories would not run and the fields would not produce. We are locked in a great struggle to retake what is ours, and they are our simplest, most essential soldiers in the war. Without them, we are nothing, and we must do everything we can to inspire loyalty and devotion to our cause within them. Under our rule, some measures of stability has returned to Western Russia. But stability does not mean prosperity. Many of our citizens are destitute and live in horrendous conditions. We cannot abandon our people to, to poverty if we expect them to contribute to reclaiming the Union. Using a new industrial might, we will start... New development programs will both bring prosperity to the downtrodden and proletariat and prepare them for the inevitable war. Poverty rate will begin to improve. Okay, we've got some more events. I love the events. I love events. I really do. But I do prefer focuses. Love it, love it, love it. Let's go and uh, integrate Vorkuta. Look at it. Our industry is looking amazing. The simplest tools, industrial equipment. Not bad. The simplest orders, the simplest tools. The anarchy we were thrown into when the Germans invaded forced us to improvise. Stripped of most of our industry, we learned to make do with what we had left. Using that, we built tanks and planes using repurposed equipment and cobbled together factories. With the simplest of tools, we built an army to retake Russia, but these tools will no longer suffice. As our economy begins to recover, and our connections with the outside world are restored, new opportunities to expand our industry become available. America and other free nations of the world have access to a specialty specialty uh, equipment purpose built to make modern weapons and vehicles. For a modest sum, they can be persuaded to part with similar equipment. And once these new machines are in our hands, and our engineers can dismantle them and learn how they work, no longer will we make do with improvised industrial equipment. Our new tools will be suited for the massive task ahead. More spending, more, more spend, 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 spend. We must build up as many factories as possible. You know what? Screw it. Just build everything here. I don't care what it takes. Literally build up in every single province. Because we must think about the war effort, of course. But even after the war effort as well. So, I don't even care. Just build, 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 build. Beautiful. And continue integrating places. Hey, we're almost done. Tom to his left. Five billion? It's looking a little better. It is getting better and better and better. Simple tools and simple orders. Russia struggled to industrialize for centuries, a struggle that was only amplified during the Soviet Union. We made significant progress within our borders as we built more factories and plants we cannot afford to overlook an equally important sector of our economy, agriculture. While our factories have modernized and expanded, our farms, especially in the more isolated rural communities, have lingered in the era of the horse-drawn plow. The agricultural workers of the Union must not be abandoned. We will buy modern farm equipment from the West and begin distribution programs for the rural agricultural collective. Some of the equipment will be reverse engineered so we can begin producing our own domestic versions. Soon, Soviet farmers will drive Soviet tractors across the Soviet fields, and there will be plenty of Soviet crops to go around. Great. I love it. Great ideas. England and Wales at war. Go figure. The most crucial objective. From the Arctic to the Steep. The entire population of the front marches in unison towards two primary goals. The total liberation of the Union and the destruction of the fascist invaders. For our workers, this means making sure our economy is expanded as rapidly as possible before the war begins. Once the bullets start flying, the die will have already been cast. However, until that moment, the laborers of the front are working around the clock to build up our industry to compete with the Germans. Grand Marshal Tukhachevsky has ordered that industrial expansion be accelerated even further. Some of his advisors warn of the dangers of taking large, such large loans, yet others point out that the economy is growing rapidly on its own, and this is no time to try to enforce moderation. The Marshal has listened to the words, and he's unconcerned about the economy. The final victory is at hand, and it will pay any price to achieve it. We get a massive amount more of debt. Wow. We get more slots, which is nice. Wow, how many more factories do we have? Holy crap. More military factories? Um, hey, I'll, I'll put them on helicopters. We have so many guns now. Support companies are great. We're doing, I'm, lo I'm loving this campaign. This is a lot of fun. Even more casts. I love casts. Ooh, more land auction? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, we can do this too. Oh, yes. Returning expatriates, agriculture, scientific construction, repurpose Soviet, more equipment. Yes. And this gives us more infrastructure so we can do even more stuff with that. Yes, please. Most crucial objective. Actually, I don't want to do that. 13 days. That's fine. 
a productive union. It is almost inconceivable how far we've come in in such a short time. Where there was once a war-torn hellscape, there is now a thriving nation. Across Western Russia, the people of the front work with a sense of purpose, knowing that every ounce of effort they give is contributing to our glorious cause. Every day, more guns come off the assembly lines, and more ammo crates are shipped off to the armories. It is not just a war industry that is thriving, however. In the fields of Russia, our farmers are harvesting more crops than ever before, with the be benefit of their new tractors and fertilizers. Our civilian industry produces more commodities for the proletariat to ease their struggle and reward them for their hard work. Even international observers have noticed how rapidly our nation is getting back on its feet. Some have even dared to speculate Russia may be the next global economic titan. Of course, before that can happen, there is a war to be won, and we m now must be ready. Beautiful. Let's get some more research done as well. Oh, Puyi is dead. Oh, well, my apologies and condolences to Puyi. That's a little bit ahead of time. Let's go ahead and finally do... Maybe get some better armor, actually. We don't produce garbage, right? <clears throat> a day in the life of Bazanov Zinon. 5 a.m. Wake. Do morning calisthenics before eating a breakfast of fried egg sandwich. Say goodbye to the wife before hoping, hoping on the bus to work. 7 a.m. Arrive at the Perm Motor Works. Clock in and prepare for my ship at the factory. I am one of the technicians on the truck production lines responsible for installing door panels. 9.30 a.m. My first break. Take five minutes to relieve myself and grab a small glass of water, then back to work. 12. Noon. Lunch. Eat hot soup and tea from a factory canteen. <clears throat> Other co-workers have heard the rumor there will be a switch on the aircraft, but have not seen any evidence of that. Having 15 minutes to eat before going back to work. 3.30 p.m. Longer break than usual. Everyone is instructed to gather in the factory courtyard to be hear a speech by a hero of the Red Army. Many have heard these ex exultations before, and it's doubtful they are having the effect they once did. Some fall asleep standing up, but everyone is thankful for the longer break. 6.15 p.m. Fall fire alarm. Everyone lines up to evacuate, but management stops us midway. They sit in a different part of the factory. We can slug we sluggishly return to work. I see fire, fire engines in the distance. 7 p.m. Quitting time, clock out, get on the bus, go home. 8 p.m., dinner alone, black bread, sausage, and vodka. My wife and kids have already eaten long ago, children are already asleep. 9 p.m., in bed, thinking to myself, I cannot really live like this for much longer. 9.45 p.m., asleep. Just think of the, what, what you're working for, but that is going to conclude today's episode. If you enjoyed it, because I really enjoyed this episode, but if you enjoyed it, please consider leaving a like. It does help me out. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, like I always say. And I will see you tomorrow, when we will probably take out the Republic of Kazakhstan, and maybe even unify the rest of Russia. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.